October 10th, 2008. We're at the home of Mr. Boyd Crawford at his home in Greeley, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Boyd, and uh, thanks for participating today. Thank, thank you for coming. You bet. Let's start out, if we could. If you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, I was, <clears throat> I was born in... <clears throat> excuse me. I was born in Meeker, Colorado on December 30, 1924. My father always called me the taxi taxi. <laughs> Did you have uh, uh, any siblings? Yes, I had, a, had two brothers and two sisters. Okay. I was the oldest one of the family. And what what did your father do for a living? Uh, he farmed. They were farmers. Uh, my grandfather homesteaded here in 1884. Okay. So we're pioneers. I'll be darned. Tell me a little bit about uh, what you were doing prior to entering the service. Uh, I was, well, I graduated from high school in the spring of uh, 43. And I wanted to join the service then, but my dad wouldn't let me. He said, you got to stay here till I get the crops in this fall. So then that fall, November, then he signed the waiver so I could enlist. I enlisted in the Navy then. You enlisted as opposed to being uh, drafted? Yeah, right. Now, uh, coming from Meeker, how did you choose to, to join the Navy? Well, I didn't want to I didn't want to walk on the ground. I wanted to join the Navy and either be on a ship or an airplane. And uh, where did you take your basic training? Basic training is very good, I know. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> do you remember the day you left home? what that was like, uh, saying goodbye to the family and, and all? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah well, it's been a long time ago, of course. But yeah. It's, but we left there in, I think it was sometime in October. Yeah. What was, uh, what was... Well, maybe it's first of November, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Uh, what was, uh, what was basic training like? What did you... Uh, that was pretty good. I just, as I never imagined going to Idaho, being in the Navy. Yeah. That it was was good. And how was the uh, how was the transition from civilian life to military life? Was that uh, must have been much of an adjustment for you? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I raised back then, you know, everything was tough, and of course you didn't know how poor you really you really were back in those days. I'll be so uh, the adjustment was really, I guess, probably. With our salary fifty one dollars a month, I could say it probably was a little better than civilian life. Uh -huh. It was wasn't much money, but at least that and your clothes and all your food. But you had money to spend that you didn't have before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then from uh, basic training in Idaho, where did where did you go from there? Well, I went down to Millington, Tennessee, to radio school. And then from there, I went to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, to gunnery school and flight school. And then from there, we had come up to Hutchison, Kansas, and went to advanced flight school up there. And where I met my, my pilot there, I opened the Bombay doors when we come back from my trip that day, one day. And this officer stuck his head in right after opening and he said, Are you Mr. Crawford? And I said, Yes, sir. And he said, I think you know my wife. And I said, <laughs> And I said, I don't think so. And he said, Well, her name is Patty Menifee. Oh, yeah, she was my English teacher in high school. Is that right? And uh, he said, uh, We want you to come out and spend the weekend with us, get better acquainted. I said, Patty wants to see you work. So I've been out of school about a year then, sometime. So I went out that weekend and met with him and we talked to him and whatnot. And he said, well, what I really want is I want you to go with me as my, my flight radio operator. 
and he served with me. And I said, boy, and I said, okay. So right after that, well, then we went down to Jacksonville, Florida and took flight training down to Cuba and back. And uh, we'd go down to Cuba and spend the night and then come back the next day flying. And so then we, then we come back, but then we went to, <clears throat> out to California and just on over to the Pacific, and over to Guam. What, uh, what, what plane did you guys fly? A PB-4 Y2. It's the Navy version of the old B-24. Oh, had, I didn't realize they had that. It had hydraulic turrets on the side instead of open hatches. Like the Army B-24 had open hatches. They, but this one had hydraulic We had 14 50 calibers and two 20 millimeter cannons in the nose on our plane. And we flew submarine patrol from Japan to Australia and New Zealand. And you, you served as the radio man on, on I board? I the radio sonar operator. And of course also a gunner if we were attacked. But we were never attacked because back then what it is, we had the, the fighter planes were pretty well held back from where we went. But we'd just fly over and when I'd pick up a submarine on the sonar, then we'd drop down a bomb it. And then we'd fly around to see what it come up so we can bomb it again. And then we uh, then we'd fly around and just before we'd Leave, come back when a good gas got so low, well, we dropped down and strafed all the fishing boats because they told us there were spies on it. And the fishermen said, I don't know how many innocent people we killed, of course, but, but they told us that they were, were spies and maybe they were, who knows. Now, when, when you left from, from California, did you guys fly over to, or did you take a ship over? How did you flew get over. Flew over. How long did that take? Well, it didn't take long. We flew to Hawaii, and then we spent a while there, a little more training around, and then we flew straight to Guam. We had our own airplane and everything. How, how big of a crew did you have on that on a, a plane like that? Well, let's see. There was, there was a two gunners in the nose, one on the machine gun and the other on the cannons. The gunner on the two side gunners, the tail gunner, and uh, and another top gunner on the back of me. So we had two top turrets, two side turrets. And, uh, and you, you're up towards the cockpit? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah up towards the pilot, just like behind the pilot. Okay. Yeah. Had you ever flown before prior to the service? No. <laughs> I didn't hardly know what an airplane looked like. But they didn't have it in over in that country then. Yeah, yeah. Did, now, did you have a choice as to what you got into, the sonar radar, uh, radio, or was that, uh, were you just told, this is the, this is the direction you're going? Uh, I don't remember for sure. Oh, I think I just, I think they just assigned me to Yeah, yeah. Because I think that's where they thought they were going to need uh -huh. my guys and radio operators above the airplanes. And I yeah. Think it was just, I think they signed that. Yeah, yeah. So down in Jacksonville, where we had a gunnery school just west of there, so we took gunnery training there. That they crawl into those turrets and shoot the targets and whatnot. And, and then we practiced uh, with the water landing planes, seaplanes, out of Jacksonville. There. We'd fly to land on the Jacksonville River and we'd fly around. Now, <clears throat> you flew into Guam. Was Guam your home base uh, in the Pacific? No, no uh, Miami was the home base here. Yeah. But when, once you went overseas, uh, you were based out of, you did all your flights Guam. out of Guam or? Uh, Guam, yeah. yeah. That was our home base. And, and I spent all my time on Guam or just flying. Now my pilot was a company commander, so we flew mail to all the other outposts we had. We had an outpost down in Palo Alto and uh, 
And we had another outpost on Saipan. And uh, then later in the world, we had one on Iwo Jima. And yeah. we just, because our squadron covered the whole South Pacific. Wow. And what would that, what would an average mission, how long would that, uh, how would you, how long would you be uh, out? Be about 16 hours every day. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we flew 16 hours every day, and did seven days a week. What, what would you do uh, in that downtime? I mean, were you busy? I mean, I imagine, was there periods of downtime? Or what would you do during that 16 hours to... Well, about all the time we're down, we were sleeping. Well, then we'd, uh, and as we'd go down to the beach, and we'd swim meat hunt for seashells. And we get those, and then we take them and bury them in an anthill. Then the ants beat all the, the things out of the shells, you know. Then they yeah. take them back and wash them in of it. And at one time, I had a whole cigar box full of them. And didn't see shells and whatnot. And I've got some somewhere, I think, today, but I'm not sure what's where they are. But there was all different kinds of seashells. Well. Tell me from uh, the viewpoint of a, uh, a farm boy from Meeker, what was it like to to see all the... I mean, I, I can't imagine you, you traveled growing up too far away from from uh, from Meeker. No. What was it like traveling to all these exotic locations in the, around well, it's, there? It's totally different. It's kind of a lot like our trip to Washington was. You know, it was just, you know, mind-boggling of the things you see. Especially there, we'd never... Now, outside of going to the football game, I'd never been out of the town. Yeah. And we'd go around to the local towns around there. Right, right. And play football, but other than that, like... So here, you now you're you're going to, I mean, just in the States, to Florida and California, and then Hawaii, Guam, you rattled off a whole bunch of Pacific Islands. Yeah. That must have been, uh, yeah. must have been exciting for, yeah, for that, yeah, for that was, time. Yeah. yeah. And, uh... During that time on Guam, there was a whole bunch of Japanese soldiers that they had never captured. They were on the far end of the island, up in the mountains, and they stayed up there. And they never bothered anybody. They stayed hid up there. And after the war was over for a year, after I was home, about a year, I remember reading they finally surrendered. A hundred and some of them surrendered then. They finally got the word to them. That the war was over, Japan had surrendered, and they finally surrendered. But that was a year after the war was over. Wow, wow. How many, uh, how many subs was your, your plane uh, credited with, uh, with sinking? Do you have any, uh, any records in that? No, I don't have any records. Yeah. So it was toward the tail end, the last end of the war, the time we got down there. So, but I just can't remember. But but we didn't, being my pilot was a company commander, we didn't do as much actual fighting as the others did. His main, his main job was making sure everybody was on track and flying and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But we did fly the long hours. And what, what, what would you do to, to occupy your time or pass the time during the, these long 16 hour days? Uh, you just, you sit there on the on your radio station and listen to the radio. We had to, took everything in Morse code and then watch the sonar screen to see if you had any sign of any submarine or anything there. Because they'd fly around over and all the area covered and just watch that. And the minute you seen the sun of a sub, you just tap the button and then the, the pilot Caught up that, I mean, he, he was watching too, but he had other things to look for. Right, right. And then he would, he had a screen up there, then he would just follow the signals down to the port and then drop the bomb on the subway. What, what were conditions like in the plane? Were you, uh, as far as comfort, was it, uh, was it pressurized? Did you have to wear uh, uh, additional clothing for the, for the cold? No, uh, no. no? No, I didn't tell her. It was pretty good. We had a good lunch with us and whatnot. And 
That way they take good care of us there. Really. And, and conditions back at the base were good as well as far as sleeping yeah, conditions and yeah. food and, and yeah, such? Yeah, we had the, uh, well, fact is, another guy and I, we went and built a shower out there. We, I'd had some experience with cutting, doing plumbing when I was back in the ranch, you know, and so and they said it could get a little bit too, so we worked over and set up and made, made our own shower. So we had a had a shower there for a crew of shower, you know, which made it a little better. Then we'd go to movies, lots of times we'd have a show, outdoor movies at night when we weren't flying. And, and it'd be pretty good, except if it rained, you couldn't even see the screen. Is that right? Oh, when it rains over there, it just, it just like drawing a curtain down. It's, it's really something terrible. The water, you just can't imagine how much water falls. But we could go out and pick pineapple out there and uh, bananas, artichokes, hmm. stuff like that out there. The, so we had a lot of stuff like that. And we had, uh, we could have two beers a day. And they, uh, were, they able to, were they able to keep them cool or were you drinking warm beer? Uh, yeah, they were probably just average. They weren't cool like you go on today, you know, what not. You know. Uh, yeah. Well, coming from a, from a drier, cooler state, did the humidity and the heat affect you at all? Uh, Mm, I don't think it affected me, but it was different, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, worst thing was the, the much rain over there, you know, like, you just can't believe it. Coming from Colorado, you can't believe right. much water. Right. Huh. How was, how was communications back and forth, uh, to home? Were you, was that pretty reliable? Were you able to get letters and such pretty uh, regularly or? Yeah, they, I don't know how long it took them to get there, I think about two weeks, something like that. But I got letters every now and then, you know, from home. In, in, your, in your time over there, did you ever happen to run into anybody you knew from back home or by chance run into anybody? Uh, no, I yeah. didn't. Yeah. When you enlisted, did you enlist alone, or did you and a bunch of buddies go off together, or how did... I enlisted alone. Yeah. I didn't, uh, outside of my teacher, I didn't meet anybody that I never... Well, now, I take that back, too, because I, uh, I had an uncle. My granddad's brother lived in Wichita. And four of us guys there in, in Hutchison, we bought us an uh, old model, model T Ford, and we'd go to Wichita every weekend for Liberty. And I went and called on my uncle and what kind of meeting with him right off here there. Yeah. But other than that, that's the only people I ever met anywhere on the line. Or yeah. Did. Um do you remember where you were when you heard that the Japanese had finally surrendered? And what that was like? Yeah, we were, I can't remember whether we were on a flight or back at the base for sure. If we were some out there, I think we were on a mission. Most likely anyway, this was. And then of course right after that, then they started to discard the guys pretty quick after that. So I wasn't there an awful lot longer after that. Then they flew us back to Hawaii, and then we took a ship from there. That the first time I was ever on a Navy ship. Now, how, once again, how was that? Here's a, a rancher from Meeker uh, on the high sea. Did you get your sea legs, or how how that worked? Yeah, out? a little. I wasn't as bad as some of the guys. Oh, some of the guys are just because he just plump felt because they were throwing up everywhere, you know, and. I didn't feel good, but I really didn't get as bad as they did. And they named the ship the Rockingham, and everybody said, now I know why they named it the Rockingham. It was just rocking all the way back to San Diego, not San Diego, but San Francisco. 
And in San Francisco, you took a train on in to back home, or? Well, I went to the hospital there. And then, oh, you did? Yeah. And I had some surgery and whatnot. And, and then I come Re back. Related to something yeah. overseas, or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, when we come back on one trip, we would run short on gas. And we just hit the runways as the gas run out. And uh, of course, that way you hadn't got any motor to reverse the, the props that give you brakes. And we went off the end of the runway and kind of bunged up a little bit. It wasn't anything serious. You know, nobody was really seriously hurt. But it was just one of those times that we spent a little too long scraping the boats down there. Hmm. But other than that, why it was... But I think the worst thing was that ride back from Hawaii to San Francisco, that old ship rocking in. It was really... But they were just... Some of them never ate a bite all the way back. Well, they just stayed there in their bunk and heaved up. And it was... I was just mighty glad I didn't get assigned to a ship and be in an airplane. Yeah, right, yeah. right. How, uh, other to, other than that, uh, I guess more or less a crash landing, did you ever have any other close encounters as far as engine or plane yeah. troubles or uh, uh, everything else was pretty smooth? Yeah, everything was pretty smooth, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there was, no, we didn't have any problems in our so. But I think probably the most experience that was different. Uh, maybe I be careful how I say this, but anyway, we flew the mail up to Iwo Jima, and up there they built all their outhouses over sulfur pits, and because that would eat up all the waste, you know, they never didn't have to clean them up because. The sulfur just, and they was steam coming out of them all the time, you know. And when you went in there and sat down, you didn't read the news, brother, you just sat down. Then you got up and got out of there quick because it was hot. Oh. Yeah. And it was, it was an experience, I tell you. Yeah. Once you went in there, you never went another, and you could go you could, as long as you could to you. <laughs> it was. Uh, uh, when you were doing the various stopping at various islands for mail drops and such, or like like Iwo, uh, what were the islands like? Was there still a lot of damage from from the battles there, or what what were you finding when you when you would land at these various locations? Uh, there was a lot of uh, you would see a lot of damage here and there. You know, I think probably the most interesting thing was there's were you seen at. Uh, on TV, they had that uh, survivor Palau. Well, we, we had an advance base on the Palau there, and we used to go down there and deliver the mail every now and then. And uh, one of the guys in there had a had a little pet monkey. He rode on his shoulder all the time, and he'd walk up and, and uh, you shake hands and you know, and that monkey reach over your pocket and get your cigarettes out, and then he go up and. Uh, <laughs> and it just a funny thing, but it was. But anyway, that survivor Palau, did you see it? I've seen TV. bits and pieces of it. Yeah. Remember seeing the old ships down on the water? And uh, I think that was probably one thing that I didn't see it then, but I think it, afterwards it really well, like memories of it, devastation and whatnot. Of course, the island was pretty well shot up everywhere. You could see that flying over. You could see all the ships on the bottom. Is that just vaguely? You could see some of them. You know. huh. Sometimes, you know, but you see a little bit of there. But, but seeing that tug on TV really brought back memories of it real well. Have you ever had a chance to travel back to any of the places you were overseas at all? Or? No. 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 Well, the only we went back to Hawaii once. I went back there. I sold potatoes and onions after I got back. And uh, so the potato growers I worked for sent me, my wife and I, out there way to a, We had a convention out there in Hawaii. And we went out there and 
made a weak character traveling around. Well, I imagine, you know, it was three or four years after it happened, but when you were in, when you were stationed at one of the stops you made in Hawaii, was there still a lot of damage to, to Pearl Harbor, or they had pretty much cleaned that all up when, when uh, well, it was, the times you were there? It was pretty well, I mean, you know. It was, oh, she could still see the sunken ships out there, then the Arizona and whatnot. And, uh, in fact, it's when we went out there, they took us, the whole group of us, toured all the, the Arizona and all the different monuments out around there where they were sunk. And, but that's the only place where they were been back since then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once, uh, once you arrived back from Hawaii on that uh, horrible ship ride, how long were, and had some surgery, how long were you in, uh, hospitalized there in San Francisco? Oh, 30 days, I think, after something like that. And then, and then you were discharged or, or, or sent back yeah, to... Yeah, no, I was discharged, yeah. And took a, took a train back home, or where'd you go from, from there? Mm -hmm. Never happened. Right? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm sure it was a train, but I don't. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. You remember uh, your homecoming when you finally got home and saw your folks and yeah, mm -hmm. and such was a pretty yeah, nice it experience. Was, it was kind of like uh, was on the honor flight. You know, what everybody greeted us. You know, when we got back, it was, was kind of like that. Only not that big, of yeah. course. Yeah. 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 And what did, what did you do once you got back home? Did you did, did you rest a while, or did you go off to no. school, back to work? Uh, well, I went. I bought my grandfather's ranch right after I got back. He died when I was six weeks old, so I never knew him. But I bought it from my grandmother, and uh, so I farmed it for. I guess about ten years, I guess. And then I had a chance to sell it to the oil company. They wanted to buy it and trade it for some oil shale ground over there. And I decided that anything could be in that because there really wasn't any money in that ranch, and that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. If you know anything about ranch, you know what I'm talking about. Seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and usually deeper in debt at the end of the year. Was it a hard adjustment, uh, I guess, related to my earlier question uh, about going in the military? How was your adjustment leaving the military back to civilian life? Was that much of an adjustment for you at all? And, no, well, not, yeah. not at all, yeah. yeah. And like I had to lose a little weight to get back in shape. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I put on quite a bit of weight. I weighed 200 pounds then. Really? Yeah. And so I found out I went to work and I was a little out of shape, but you had to stop and get a, take a breath or two every now and then. I imagine because of your position, 16 yeah. hours a day is in a sitting position, yeah. more or less, really. Yeah. 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 Huh. And that was the biggest adjustment is getting some of that weight off and getting back to good shape again. Because that's all we did. We didn't do any athletics or anything like right. that. Outside of out there swimming off the beach, hunting those hills, but that really wasn't hard work. But it was better than nothing, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Throughout the years, uh, did you keep in touch with any of your crew members at all, or uh, any friends you made in the service? No, I never did. I, I tried, and but they from all over the country. And right. In the Air Corps, now, they've never had a reunion of the, of the Navy Air Corps, anybody I've ever, ever noticed. Huh. So, you know, like in VFW magazines, why in the Army, they always have, every company has a reunion. Yeah, right. Every year. Yeah. But the Navy Air Corps never had any reunions that I ever noticed anybody. Huh. Well. And there wasn't from anybody in Colorado on my crew at all anywhere near it. There was one fellow in Oklahoma City. And I, 
tried to contact him, but I didn't have any luck. Yeah. yeah. I think he was the only one that I even knew his hometown. Mm. And I thought that he'd come back and I think he was here. Cancer, Nebraska, I'm not sure. So I never never seen him again either. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think uh, that period, your war experience, that period played a part in your life, had any effect on your life, or, or even or did it, or was it just three years out of your life that you did something? How did how did that how's that? Uh... Well, that's probably. But I used to say that you took you through your best years, you know, because you. Well, I had a. Four-year scholarship to any college in Colorado when I graduated my school, and I turned it down to join the Navy. And I told them, I you know, I don't want them to join the Navy, so uh, give it to somebody else in line. Wow! So I passed that up, and, and so I should have got a college education, which is always better, makes it better off, but I didn't. As I could have on the GI Bill too, but I thought I'd want to be a farmer then and get away from everything. And I imagine uh, being in your, your position then, uh, your farmer, your parents uh, farming and ranching, that you probably could have got an exemption, I, I would assume, and wouldn't have had to enlist if you didn't want to, and, or that not the case. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you could have had him. But I just felt like it was a thing to do. And, uh, as I wasn't back then, you, your parent had control until you were 21. And so, but then when I, but he sees, well, if you help me get the crops in this year, then, then I will sign so you can enlist. Hmm. And and you being the oldest, uh, then of your other siblings were of age to to go off. So you were the only one that served in your family. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, my uh, rather just enemy, he served in the Korean War. I don't don't remember how long, but he served a while. After the war, did, did your folks, your, your mom in particular, ever talk about what they were feeling while you were overseas? Uh, did she worry about you, or uh, did she ever talk about her feelings about that whole time? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. Of course, my memory's not that good anymore. Well, that, that was 60 years ago. I, I can't remember things 60 days ago, so... Yeah. Uh, but uh, well, fair enough on that. Yeah. But um, so you farmed for ten years after after you got back, and then you went into uh, you said potatoes and onions. Uh, yeah. Per yeah. Buying. Yeah. I served uh, sold down Monta Vista for nine years for the Colorado potato growers. Then I went up to Nevada for the world's biggest potato farm out there, Glen Rucker. They had 17,500 acres, all in one unit. And they put two million hundredweight in storage every year, and the rest of it was processed right out of the field. And we had two weeks off every year between the old crop and new crop. And then we traveled all around the southern United States, calling on all the customers. We had customers from up in Oregon to San Diego, up to Miami, to Buffalo, New York, and all points in the train. And you, you called on all these various, you traveled all over the country for the... Well, I, just on these two weeks. I, I did everything with the telephone. Oh, okay. And then I come back here to see my grandkids go to high school and sell onions here up to Alt.
Well, um, I guess I've gone through all the questions I can think of. Is there anything that I didn't talk about that, or didn't ask you about that you wanted to, to talk about? Uh, uh, any stories that we missed? Uh, any Anything that uh, I skipped over that uh, you would like to, to talk about? I think pretty well covered everything, I think. Is there any, uh, any closing statement you'd like to make uh, as, we, as we wind down this interview? That, uh, anything across the board you'd want to say to, to finish this out? Well, the main thing I say is that I just really enjoyed the auto flight. I think that was one of the, one of the greatest things I've been through. Excellent. And related to the war and whatnot, seeing the monument and everybody in. I think that's the main thing that I can say. That okay. All right. Well, I, uh, I want to thank you for uh, participating in this project. Uh, more importantly, though, uh, Boyd, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Now, this is a picture I've taken when I was at Chairman of the Grand Marshal of the Parade in Mecca, Colorado at the 4th of July Rodeo. I think it's been about five years ago. And you could still fit in your uniform, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>